and welcome to Chopped Greens. I am your host, Philip Amrine, sitting alongside an old timer, not to the show, but just in general. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's, that's uh, you know, to anybody who doesn't know our relationship, that probably sounds really mean. It is really mean. It is, <laughs> just in general. Uh, it is Brian Meredith. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. And today we are going to be talking a little bit about sports. You you are a sports savant, as you come to tell me. You watch you watch a lot of sports, just a little bit, a dab of everything. I do. I watch a lot of different sports. And uh, you, so you watch hockey. You watch. Do you watch golf? I do watch golf, the majors, and the so like the big events. The big events. Yeah. That's good because I do not. I. I <laughs> I, I, I've tried so hard to get into everything to be a well-rounded sports caster, but just golf will never be a hole-in-one for me. I mean, that's about as, as close to golf as I get is golf puns. Um, <laughs> once Tiger, <laughs> once Tiger uh, kind of semi-retired and is in his status right now, I kind of gave up. So let's talk about the NBA because you, you've kept track of the NBA, I'm sure. <sighs> Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure what really grinds your gears is the NBA draft. So the NBA draft happened last night. Let's really just go to the top five, right? Because the rest, it doesn't matter. After that, it's a, it's a crapshoot. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So the Kings are coming in at number five. The Suns coming in at number four, 76ers. Number three, Lakers. Number two, Celtics. Number one. Now, of course, coming into the draft... The uh, the Celtics did have the best chance, a 25% chance, to get the number one pick. Uh, the Phoenix Suns had the second best with just under 20%, 19.9. Los Angeles Lakers coming in at third. And it goes down about 3% each time from there. The only real jump here was the Phoenix Suns, of course, our hometown team, getting booted out of the top three, now having to face that number four slot right out of there. So it's not looking good for us on the Phoenix Suns' part. Terrible. They should have had number two pick. Boston's the big winner, obviously, because they are still in the playoffs and they got the number one pick. Man, Paul Pierce just keeps giving them gifts even after retiring. <laughs> but the Lakers, I think the envelope was frozen again. Oh, my gosh. So you're saying that the... So you are one of the old fuddy-duddies who believes that the original... Uh, envelope was frozen. Oh, yeah. When Patrick Ewing came out uh, for the draft, I believe it was in 85, and the Knicks really needed a player. They got the number one pick. Uh huh. And uh, so the Phoenix Suns, pretty big market. Phoenix being a uh, top seven, you know. Philadelphia, pretty big market. Uh,. Goes to number three, of course. No, nowhere near L.A., of course. But Boston. Boston is, uh, is, is number one, and they're taking home your, uh, your conspiracy theory all the way to the top. You know, it kind of scares me when Magic Johnson tells his head coach, don't worry, we're going to get a top three pick uh-huh. two weeks before the draft. Uh-huh. Um... And it doesn't worry you at all that, let's see here, that right before the draft, he was noticeably worrisome. He was sweating it, right? You could, oh. see, you could see out of the where the follicles normally are for here, he was sweating. <laughs> he was pouring sweat. They were spraying water on the oh back of his gosh. head before they put the camera on him. All right, so, so what is your theory? How, do, how does one fix the ping pong draft? How does somebody, you know, I, I've heard maybe iron. Iron inside the ping pong balls. <laughs> how how does it work? Although I I think if my if I, my recollection is my fancy word recollection is right, the ping pong travels to the top and then it slides down. So it can't be weighted down. It has to go to the top. So helium maybe. I think they had David Blaine there, and whatever ball came up, oh. he was gonna pull it out, and it was gonna say the magic on it. It was gonna say magic. Magic for the sun, for for the Lakers rather. Yep. Okay, so what what is the advantage of have giving the Lakers if if they're so bad, which they have been, right? You have to be bad in order to go there. It wasn't like they were a 
uh, just missing the playoffs. They weren't the Miami Heat who got the number 14 pick. They weren't the Miami Heat who just missed the playoffs and just, you know, stayed where they were. They didn't travel all the way up to number two from there. No, they were the number three percentage chance team to get it. What is the advantage of not giving them even the number one pick? Well, if they gave them the number one pick, it'd be too obvious. Oh, my gosh. Of course it would be. Um, so last year when they were really bad and they were forced to have the number two pick, that would have been too obvious as well. It would have. Listen, that team won five out of their last six games. Uh-huh. And Magic, Magic was on record for saying that he didn't like it. And they still got the number two pick. Come on. <laughs> There's no way they would have just said, oh, let's actually go out and win some games unless we know we're going to get a top three pick. Oh, ooh, ooh, okay, so let me entertain the premise here. Let me, let me actually put on my conspiracy theorist, JFK, there was a second gunman. <laughs> let me just entertain this notion. So, so what you're saying is, is that it even came from the top, the tippy top, as they say. Then they were like, you know what? We've got this in the bag. Go ahead and play your your youngest players. Forget Zub. Uh, forget uh, uh, who did they get? Luau Deng. Forget <laughs> uh, the guy from the Cleveland Cavaliers, the center. Um, I can't remember his I name, but he's, he's, he's their either. highest paid player right now. And forget him. What well, we're going to rest them for the rest of the year, and we're going to play our youngest players. And you know what? Let's win five in a row. That's when five in a row. Well, they need to worry about the percentages. They knew the Suns were going to lose. If the Lakers didn't get the top three pick, the pick that they had this year would have gone to uh, the 76ers. It would have gone to the 76ers. And their 2019 first round pick would have gone to the Orlando Magic. The Orlando Magic. You think the NBA is going to let that happen? Brian. Brian, I, I, okay. Come on, man. Okay, so here's where I need something. I just don't understand the why. If you're going to fix something, right? I need to see the benefit. I need to because nobody's going to rob a bank for nine dollars. <laughs> so nobody's going to go to a gas station and get caught stealing twelve things of Snickers. If you're the NBA and you're going to fix it to make sure the premier league, the premier centerpiece of your league, the Los Angeles Lakers, who outsell everybody else in China, who have a great worldwide national brand. We see, you know, the Olympics in Brazil and we see Laker jerseys, Kobe jerseys. If they have this great brand and the NBA is trying to fix it, why give them the number two pick? Especially last year where there was only one player, Ben Simmons. Ingram was... The riskier of the picks. But Ben Simmons, everybody knows, is the number one pick. Going further back, they're the second overall pick then. They've had four years where they had to be in the top three. Why not give them the number one pick any of those years? Why stick them with the D'Angelo Russells, not the Kristaps Porzingis? Why stick them with Brandon Ingram, not Ben Simmons? Why? Why? Just give me the why. Because, first of all, they know Boston, if they actually keep their pick, is not going to pick LeVar Ball. Lonzo Ball. Lonzo Ball, I, I can understand. Yeah. Of you get LeVar Ball. Ball. You get LeVar. You All get right. both balls. Plus, they already have Isaiah Thomas over there. They have a bunch of good point guards. They don't really need a point guard. So this way, they give the Celtics a pick. The Celtics might trade it. I'm not sure what they're going to do, but Lonzo Ball has made sure that he's going to become a Laker. His dad has said that He's not working out for any other teams That's true. but was, the Lakers. I was going to bring that up. He's 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 solely going to work out for the Lakers. So they know that whoever got the number one pick's not going to take him. He's a headache. Nobody wants to deal with his dad. So then why not stick them in the third slot where it would be much more inconspicuous to your point? Well, because if they put somebody in the second slot, they're going to take him. If it was a son's, I'd but you just but, 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 but you just said nobody's going to take him uh, on on the first spot if he's that much of a headache. Well, not the Celtics. But if okay, so, okay, so okay, let's go whole NBA. We'll go the whole global basketball all around the if, world. If the Suns had got the number one pick, okay, they would have really had a difficult choice. I don't. I like both of the point guards. Obviously, I don't like the one's father. <laughs> I want him to take the guard out of Kansas. 
Um, Marquise Fultz? No, no, no that's um, Wyoming. Josh Jackson. Oh, yes. That's who I want them to take. I wanted them to get number three pick, let Fultz go, let Ball go, take Josh Jackson. Now they could end up – it's still a point guard they have projected to go next. And well, that's the thing. Okay, so let's talk about this realistically, Brian. So if you're the Celtics, and let's go forward with the Celtics plan because I think it's a, a, a really interesting dichotomy of the Celtics and the Lakers. They're both the heritage franchises. You know, we go back to Mag- Magic Bird and how they've grown to be the either opposite faces of the league. You know, if the Boston Celtics are doing good on the one side and the Los Angeles Lakers are doing good on the other, it's good for the whole league. One rising tide raises all ships, so to speak. So if we go to the Celtics and they have the number one pick, and, and again, entertaining the premise that they have enough point guards with Marcus Smart, Isaiah Thomas, many, many... Analysts have pointed out the fact that Isaiah Thomas himself is not good enough to be a shooting guard. I've always I've always favored the idea of moving him to shooting guard, but his size pretty much dictates that he has to stay at point guard. However, however, many rumors have have also come out, and I, I kind of believe this that Isaiah Thomas will not be re-signed by the Celtics. As crazy as that sounds, if you max him out and he has to stay there all the way to the to the end of that, it could almost be of that contract, it could almost be a poison pill contract where you're paying him 30 plus million at the end of that contract at a 35 million uh, a 35 year old Isaiah Thomas who's only offensive uh, an offensive primary point guard, who's ball dominant as well. It's not, it's not like you have, a, let's say, a, a Kyrie Irving, right, who can dish it and can assist uh, paired alongside a very giving superstar LeBron James or even something of the dichotomy of uh, Chris Paul, a very prototypical point guard who often gives up the ball to a much scoring option of DeAndre Jordan or Blake Griffin. That's why those, those pairings work. Not all of them need, a, need the ball. If, if they let Isaiah Thomas go and they're purely going for the best point guard, they, they can take Markel Fultz, right? Okay. I, yeah, I would take him over a ball right now. Just, just purely, even if, if, if you just had a fair chance. So then why, if you were the Lakers, why would they not, if they're going to fix all this, why would they not go to the number one pick and just get the better, better overall it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, Isaiah Thomas is only 28 years old. Right. But he's going to, if he if he does indeed gain a max contract, it'll be through his 33-year-old uh, contract year. He'll be 33 years old when that final $30 million payment is due. Man, this is Celtics. They're printing money under that stadium. They don't care. They'll but, sign him to a max contract, get what they can from him. But there's only a finite amount of resources. That's the idea of a cap, uh, a fine cap. I mean, even though it's a soft cap where you can go above for the luxury tax, you still at some point need to meet under there and get as many, accrue as many assets, uh, projecting assets for as little as you can. So that way when they actually do fully realize their financial uh, actuality. So so in, in essence, right now, Isaiah Thomas is making, I believe, around $7 million per year. We can both agree that that's a huge bargain, right? It is a huge bargain. Because there, he's he's a 35 average uh, point guard in the MVP discussion. He's and carried that team all year. He's almost the Dak Prescott or the Russell Wilson of the NBA, where it's such a phenomenal value. It allows you cap maneuverability to get an Al Horford to trade away the rest of your pieces so that way you can pair them with him before he, he actually he's necessary to pay that thirty million. I I think Boston's gonna trade that pick to somebody. But But where would they where would they go with that? Where would would they because it, it can only do I, so much. Because okay, so let's say for instance, does Jimmy Butler do it for you? Yeah. <sighs> So, because then what What do you have? You have an Isaiah Thomas, Jimmy Butler, Al Horford threesome there that could maybe then push the Cavs to a game five, maybe, game six. What does that do for you? What about this? Okay. And this just popped in my head. What about the Clippers? Okay. Trading Blake Griffin straight up for the first round pick. 
Uh, well, you'd have to make the cap cap um, work both ways. So essentially, you would have to trade some. Well, he's all well. Blake's making a lot of money. He him. is making a lot of money, and besides that, the besides the point, you'd almost have to <laughs> sign and trade him. So actually, in reality, what what if I'm the Celtics and I want Blake Griffin? Which I, I go well. Which you right still is kind of an iffy. iffy with health. But if you want him, you get him in the free agency. You get him in the free agency period because it doesn't cost you anything to get him. You could theoretically get him, sign him for a max deal that you're allowed to not get that designated player option. You could sign him to a max deal for four years, I believe, or or a year by year deal, which is kind of what the standard now, the norm is until so that way players can maximize their earnings and then uh, trade away some of that bench, some of those supporting Avery Bradley, Marcus Smart players that you have in order to get yet another superstar, get maybe a a disgruntled Boogie Cousins or get a Boogie Boogie. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you have to do, right? That's what you have to do. So so okay, so there I don't think Boogie's going anywhere. No, but, no, no, but what I'm saying is it's a, it's of that situation. But if the Clippers obviously whatever they have is not working. Well, of course. Griffin I mean, keeps getting hurt. They don't have the, the players. They need something. If they can get the number one pick, Boston thinks maybe this one piece. I know you're talking about the financials, so I'm I know. real not about sure about that. But okay, so if they could do something like that. Okay, so, so you're saying if you're Boston and coming away from this specific draft where you get the number one overall pick, you would cash in your chips right now with the Cavs in the East blocking you, acting as a blockade, acting as the the great big beautiful wall of the East and not being able to hurdle, you would say that something that you can trade for with that number one overall pick and maybe some other pieces to make the cap room work, that team, based with Isaiah Thomas, uh, Al Horford, and whatever pick, whatever you get in return for that number one pick, is going to beat the Cavs? <sighs> Because that's the only way I see you doing that. But if you're Boston and you don't think that you can beat the Cavs in the next year or two, you take this pick and you start trading for future number ones and start building for well, when LeBron gets older. Either course. way, you're still Of course, so that's, that that's kind of where what, – what is at the crux of this conversation, Brian. Is I'm not sure who it would be. Now, that – and that would be almost something of a restoration, right? You're hoping to trade in, in that reverse scenario of trading away the pieces that you already have. You're hoping to trade away Isaiah Thomas, hopefully get some sort of – pick uh, something along the lines of what you got from the Nets where it's, you know, it would amount to yet another number one, number another number one, another number one pick, maybe an up and coming prospect, maybe like a Buddy Heald, something along those lines. That's really what you get in the NBA nowadays. And then trade out Horford for something, again, of similar. You're just essentially cutting away the quote unquote dead cap space, hoping that you, you do one last rebuild with your good prospects, have them all come up at the same time, and just add add a little add a little uh, sprinkles at the end there, and it'll all turn into a to a championship after LeBron. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. They want to get rid of Isaiah. I think he's still young enough. I think LeBron, maybe two more years, might hang it up. Um, depends if he wins this championship this year. He wins another one. I think he rides off into the sunset. Lakers are still kind of there with Isaiah Thomas being 30. Okay, so so let's go because that's an interesting – that's essentially re-going back to the rebuild because what the Celtics have successfully done is rebuild while still being in contention. They've risen in the ranks of standings every year while still uh, viably getting good draft picks and building organically. But in reverse – are the Lakers, who you think cheated the draft, whatever. We'll disagree about that later. But if you're the Lakers, how does this work? Because you have the three, maybe four, uh, budding stars or budding prospects, really, that, that are kind of all touted about. They've all been high draft picks that you're hoping can be the core of something special, of something post-Golden State Warriors saga or legacy and be the next great big Lakers dynasty. How, how do you move forward with the number two overall pick with that in mind? 
Well, you get Lonzo Ball. You get that other young stud they have Is there. Is that a guarantee, though? Because, really, even though he's that great, he also comes with the headache of LeVar Ball and his $500 shoes. If the Lakers don't take him, there's going to be riots in L.A. again. Mm-hmm. They're going to take think, Lonzo you think, Ball. You think the UCLA crowd is that uh, <laughs> impassioned and emblazoned that they will demand that they take Lonzo Ball? If they oh, yeah. Him? They love him. They've already been. Why do you think the dad said he's only going to try out for the, that team? Well, they love him. The balls do. But I don't know. I'm not as sure that the fan base, with the goodwill and good credit that comes with getting a Magic Johnson, a Rob Palinka in management, taking out uh, the bus and um, uh, uh, Mitch Kupchak, mm. taking them out and replacing them with those two and, and the goodwill that that fosters, I'm not sure that really they need to, that they need to trade away or really take Lonzo if they don't deem him necessary. It's all, it's almost like if you see a Kristaps Porzingis in this, in this draft where it's not a a sure thing, maybe like you said, a Josh Jackson, if he's better than everybody anticipates, or a Devin Booker even. Let's let's go even that deep. If you see somebody down there that not everybody's saying is as great, I don't think you're you're as you're necessary to take a Lonzo Ball just out of the fact that he's from California. Lavar Ball is pushing it. I don't think you're at the mercy of of the Ball family there. I- Think you're at the mercy of the fans. They take Lonzo Ball, and you know what people with hype bring? They'll get out their pitchforks and knives. You know what people that come in with hype bring? They bring free Jack agents Nicholson to leading your team. the leading the army against uh, the Lakers, saying, "Give us back Jack." No, they they'll bring free agents to the team. They'll start rebuilding around them. Like I said, they got that other kid that's talented. They're gonna think this is gonna help them. I don't see them taking anybody else. Markel Fultz, he's still a point guard. So, so you see them taking what if what if? Okay, what if? Okay, let's let's go full on conspiracy full on conspiracy theory, Brian. What if they trade away the pick and get somebody? The Lakers? Yes. Okay. Here's my here's my here's my here's Who are you gonna my, get? Who's the MVP? Who's the MVP right now, Brian? Oh no, he's not. Russell. They won't even Russell. Win. Russell. <laughs> Russell. <laughs> Ru- give me a cup oh, of crazy for the Lakers. I, no. If you're going crazy with LeVar Ball, you you might as well double dip on crazy. Trade <laughs> trade anybody besides that number one overall pick. Get Russell Westbrook and add him as the shooting guard. Um, no, because the people in Oklahoma City would start rioting. Right. <laughs> they'd go to their silos and say, give us our money back for season tickets. Yeah, no, they won't do that. They're not <sighs> going to do that. They, uh, I'm telling you, I think the Celtics are gonna trade the pick. I'm not exactly sure for what. They're gonna take Markel Fultz. Okay, well then let me put you. The Lakers are gonna take Lonzo Ball. Now here's the problem, because Philly has two picks in the top. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's Sacramento. Philadelphia has a third pick. I really hope they don't take Josh Jackson. If the Suns get Josh Jackson. I might, like, rest with my conspiracy theory somewhat. You might let all go by the wayside? I mean, because we're going back to when the Suns lost Luau Cinder on a coin flip. Ooh, you are going 1969, deep. I believe it was. Come on, you know that coin was heavier on one side. Oh, you are just attacking every conspiracy theory today. Oh, the Suns have never come up. Nothing has ever gone the Suns' way. When it has come to luck in the NBA. And that's because what about they don't Devin like Booker? Colangelo. What about Devin Booker? Well, they drafted him with like ninth overall or something. That's luck. That's that's impure luck. That's not luck, but that's not the NBA imparting it on you. Oh, so just because you're not given it doesn't mean that it's good. That's just a bunch of baloney, though, Brian. The Suns may have had bad luck, but... I would take the Suns' histor- historical franchise over, let's even go the Kings, who've only had one reign of, of, of somewhat NBA glory, and they were blocked by the Lakers. <laughs> I would take that over, let's go with the Nuggets. I mean, what have the Nuggets ever done outside of drafting Carmelo Anthony and smartly trading him away? 
I mean, aren't the aren't the uh, the Suns the most historically? If I remember this correctly, they are the historically most winningest team in the NBA. They have the yes, best winning. They are percentage. if they are not the best, they are yes, very they are on top close three, to the top, yes. and they haven't won a championship. Why no. I think that is? <laughs> Because the NBA. Oh, my gosh. What happens when Robert Ory body checks Steve Nash into the board and Amari takes two steps onto the court and he gets suspended for game six against the Spurs? We go on to lose that series. And you know what? You know what's crazy is that I, I just thought of this the other day. How crazy is it that we as fans, we as Phoenix Suns fans, well, actually, I'm not a fan. You, you, you can call yourself a fan. I'm, I'm more of an uh, impartial observer, uh, observant. Uh, but how crazy is it that we are now rooting for the Spurs? I'm not rooting for the Spurs. You're not rooting for the Spurs? You no. want the Warriors to win? You want them to sweep them? I hope the Spurs never win another game no. again. No. Oh, I don't. I you want the Warriors to win all four them. of those guys? Oh, they're gonna smoke them. I will say, I am, I am biased because of the Warriors. I need them to lose at some point because we have a little bet here on chopped greens between me and two of the other hosts, uh, Gary and Luke. Loser, we've already established, is Luke Wright, and he will be at the mercy of either me or Luke. I heard part of yes, this. Yes, yes. Just me, a little bit. Me or Gary will have the pleasure of picking out the punishment for him, either uh, between a getting one of those facial masks, uh, getting one item on their body, camera friendly, one item <laughs> <laughs> waxed, or getting uh, their nails did. Not even done. Nails did. First of all, I would never take that bet because... Well, you're now part of the there Chop Greens is family. No, there's nowhere that I'm getting waxed. <laughs> because you are a very hairy man. I am a very hairy man, and, you know, unless maybe on, like, my forehead and the little bald spot on the top of my head oh, and everywhere else... It's barely noticeable. ...is never going to happen. Spot. No, I would never take that bet. I'll get my nails painted. I have no problems with that. I'll well, you are a lone stuff. man in a female family. I am. You've had to endure a long sports purgatory of just containing all this great, fantastical son's knowledge and just <laughs> keeping it under lock and key. How do you feel to finally like have a venue to, to let it out, Brian? I do. You know, I talk to my wife all the time about sports, and you could tell she just she, glazes she, over. It's like when she talks to me about her work, I just glaze <laughs> over. Hopefully she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure she knows. Yeah, she, does. she, she, she understands. I have the same thing with my with my girlfriend where she she has that she doesn't she has that initial uh, what is it interest in in sports right where of like ooh that's cool or oh the Eagles I love birds you know and <laughs> so and but but to you know she doesn't have that next level intricacy of you know of even knowing per se the whole players um, I, oh, I I stand mistaken she does know the Steve Nash led uh, that last year she does know the entire lineup. Because she used to love basketball that much. She has since fallen off. But she does enjoy a good basketball game. Really? Yes. Uh, But but she doesn't, again, to your point, it's not, uh, she doesn't per se know, let's even say the mascots. You know, (laughs) so, uh, but she did. We did recently get into the habit of playing a little game where she would um, go to each, I would say this, this city. So let's say Chicago or Phoenix or whatever. And she would have to tell me the team. And eventually she's gotten better. So so maybe that's something. Actually, I think we can bring her on later on for Give Me Five if, if everybody's okay with that. You know what? I play the same game with my kids. Yeah. yeah you, you got to. You, as, a sports, as a sports person, if you are in the midst of the Michael Jordan era, the now LeBron James era, if you almost see it as your duty to, to make sure that they are aware of the historical relevance, Brian. The historical relevance of, of what's going on, because that way, when their kids, you know, when they're growing up and they have kids, they can tell their kids, they can tell their sons, their daughters. I mean, maybe and then we'll have uh, female football players, but they can tell them that they saw LeBron James play, that they saw, well, not Carson Palmer, but but somebody, <laughs> Larry Fitzgerald. Let's go with Larry Fitzgerald. Now, my girls will know who Larry Fitzgerald is. Uh... I don't know. I'm sure they know LeBron James, but... They, they could not pick him out of a lineup? Probably not, no. Uh, is it I have they, three daughters, one wife. 
Could you pick Ovechkin or Kershaw out of the lineup? Just out of question as we close up here. Easily. Both of them. Easily, easily. Okay, so there you go. You are an avid sports. I'm a little... Kershaw is a little harder for me just because I get him in Thonmaker. Or not Thonmaker. That's, <laughs> that's the guy from the Milwaukee Bucks. Completely different skin tone there. Um, who's the guy that's Thor on the Mets? Do you happen to... Oh, Syndergaard, right? No. No. No, he just pitched a couple nights yes, ago yes, against the he, Diamondbacks, too. Uh, and you know what? I don't even know his name. But, but everybody in the sports audience is yelling it out right now. I know. Ovech- Ovechkin would be hardest because he always has, he always the, has the frosted the, mask yes. and... But, yeah, easily Kershaw and probably, like, half of the guys in sports unless they're well, do you playing feel, cricket. Right, of course. Do you feel <laughs> justified? Do you feel vindicated? And do you feel heard about your crazy conspiracy theories? I think the NBA already knows about their conspiracy theories. I don't think me telling them what they're doing is going to make any difference. They have over 30 uh, NFL in, or excuse me NBA insiders in that room when they pick the ping pong balls. They all of them are on the payroll, payroll too. I He's told nodding you, yes. David's nodding yes. Pick the ball. Oh my gosh! Well, you know what? He had. He had you know the right there. Picking? They're picking Lonzo Ball. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, after this, we will have a word from our sponsors, and after that, we will do a Give Me Five. This is your first Give Me Five, your inaugural Give Me Five. Are you ready? I hope so. Uh, and confidence is spewing. I was just told about this a couple hours ago. Oh, it's going to be <laughs> awesome. It's going to be award-winning. Stay tuned. Time for some personal rejuvenation? Visit Aquarius Salon's award-winning stylists and get ready for summer. They do color, cuts, and highlights for your everyday wear, as well as services for proms, weddings, or any special events you have scheduled. Visit Aquarius on the northeast corner of Bell and 51st. Call 602-978-1774 for your appointment. Again, that's 602-978-1774 on the northeast corner of Bell and 51st. And tell them Philip from Chopped Green sent you. I know right now you can't hear the beat, but this is a really good jamming song. I love this song to go along with Give Me Five. And we are, <laughs> we are joined by Ruby Ramirez. Hello. So here we go. Give Me Five. Would you like to go first, Brian, or do you want me to kind of show you how it's done? I'll, I'll let Your you choice. show me how it's done. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> All right. Brian, BuzzFeed just released an article with 16 facts about the Titanic. And since I love the movie and know that my heart does indeed go on, I wanted to see if you could pass the Titanic facts quiz just like I did. All right? I got five facts about the Titanic, and I want you to tell me if they are real or if I made them up. All right? You you ready? I am. I'm psyched. All right. Here we go. Fact number one, the actual Titanic has been discovered to sink horizontally as opposed to the vertical depiction shown in the movie. True or false, Brian? Uh, I believe that is false. I do believe it split and came down vertically. That is absolutely false. Is it? Good job. Yes, I, I thought you might just <laughs> overthink the room there. <laughs> and Ruby actually helped me write one, some of these, so that's why she's not playing on this one. All right, fact number two. I, I want to see some models. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before I concede this. Some models of the, <laughs> of the, of the questions. Computers, yes. yes. A first-class ticket cost $2,560, which is more than $61,000 today. True or false? Um, that that was a lot of money back then. It was. I know it was a lot. The I don't know if it was shit. that much. He is I'll struggling. say true. You'll say true. That is absolutely true. Very nice. 100%. I thought that one might might uh, trip you up there. Hey. He's two for two. He's two for two, ladies and gentlemen. I have a fun fact at the end, too, if you don't say. If I don't say it, all right, here we go. Milton Hershey of Hershey's Chocolate fame was supposed to sail on the Titanic, but because of business plans, he ended up getting on another ship that left earlier. True or false, Brian? I would say that is false. That is absolutely true, Brian. Oh, the ships were going back and forth. Oh, the, I think there Enough? was a, a, there at was, least two. Yes, well, I think one of them was the Britannica or something along those lines. 
All right, fact number four. Not doing very good. Yeah, <laughs> no, now you just lost one. You're two and one. The original English roller coaster was on board the Titanic and lost to the sea. True or false? I'm gonna say. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go with false. There's no way they had a roller coaster in there. In, nine, in the early 1900s? Is Are that you your final answer, Brian? Maybe not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, no. so I'll, I'll say false. That is absolutely false. I did make that one up. <laughs> you, you sniffed that one out. All right, last one. Here we go. Three days before the Titanic sank, second-class passengers ate boiled hominy, grilled ox, Kidneys and bacon. Is that true or false, Brian? Second class passengers? Second class. We're not talking the people that were down the bottom with like no, Leo and this them, is right? the same this is the right on middle class. I will say that's true. That is true. Wow, mm. I thought the grilled ox might slip you up and and I thought that I might be crazy enough to just add some ox in there. Is I was kinda of questioning the bacon. Like... Yeah, oh the bacon? The bacon was like that, that is was pretty, what pretty, because back then, it had to be really salted and probably a really delicacy of some sort. All right, your turn, sir. Handing First, I have, oh, a, yes. I have a fun. All right, there was a woman on the Titanic when it sank that was, she survived. That was oh, the yes. second shipwreck yes. she survived. Yes. And what she was, was her name? Uh, Molly? Molly Brown. Molly Brown. Yeah, the sinkable young Molly sinkable Brown. Molly Brown. Good wow. job. I actually knew that one. She yeah. survived two shipwrecks. Can you imagine? What a life. I'd be done with boats after that. Well, I, I think after that she stayed in America because <laughs> at that point, I don't care where I'm at. I don't even care if I take a plane. I'm sticking on at least something that'll get back to ground. I'm not going in any more water. All right, your turn, Brian. All right. So I came up with this one on the way here. Because I drive in traffic all the time. Okay. I drive long distances in traffic, and I have to deal with stupid drivers all the time. Okay. So, do you think that you should be able to punch a person in the face that is driving in the carpool lane with one person? <laughs> or that... When the road narrows to <laughs> one lane, you know they wait till the very last second and Just cut you and off. Cut you off. Okay. And they stop. Okay. Okay. So here. So let me entertain the premise here. How would you enact? Would you just have a special honk that says "pull over, dummy"? You know, like "pull over, I'm gonna punch you." And they have to. If you get honked, you have to allow them to punch you. I, and I have a little twist to this too. I think people should have their cell phone number written on the back of their car. Oh, it's like additional to the license plate? But that could be creepy, too. Oh, yeah, because what if you're driving behind, like, the Kardashians or something and you're forced to, you know, like, they're going to get millions of texts. I don't know about that. But let's go back to the original. Okay, okay, so let's let's just... You're driving the car, uh, Wayne. And it's siphon. Everything stops. You, you see can't. the person next to you doesn't have a person in the carpool lane, but you saw them pass you like 45 minutes <laughs> earlier with nobody in there. Should you be able to just get out and give them a good whack? <laughs> I think yes. If, you know, Ruby <laughs> the Avenger says yes. I I will be a pacifist. I will be the responsible adult of the group. Uh, I say no because I just could not imagine taking the time out of my day to whack somebody on the head. Oh, I could take a yeah. long time in the world. <laughs> I, I, would, I would be it would late for work. <laughs> I would say it would make traffic more entertaining. And everybody would probably respect the carpool lane because it would be self-policing. Right? And nobody would be cutting you off. That, <laughs> see? I'm, there you go. There you go. All right. My second question here. Brian, Terry Pajera arrived in Victoria, Australia to visit family, but his holiday quickly turned into an absolute horror story. The father of two's leg began to swell in late February to the point he had to walk with a limp due to what doctors believe is a spider bite. Mr. Pajera has already had his left leg amputated, and doctors believe he will more than likely have to amputate the rest of his limbs, rendering him with no arms or legs. So, Brian, 
as you look at me with absolute horror, if I gave you the choice of losing both your legs or both your arms, which would you choose and why? So I can't have like one of each? No, <laughs> no that, although that would be interesting. You could do one armed and legged jumping jacks, I suppose, in a weird way. You'd have to be really fast though. This is actually an easy choice. I would lose both of my legs. Yeah. Because I thought as a runner I might be able to get you out, but no? No, because I don't run very much anymore and if somebody <laughs> had to somebody had to push me around for the rest of my oh, life my and man. I could use my hands. So I want that now. <laughs> I want that now. You'll sign up for that now. Yeah. Shh. You realize though if electric you, car uh, <laughs> What do you do with your legs that you really need? You need to drive. That's not true. They make cars with all that stuff with on the sticks. Their hands. Yeah. Uh, what else do you need your legs for? Really quick, Ruby, would you would you give up? Your, I agree. You agree? You would stick with with the. Uh, you need your arms. Yeah. yeah. Take the legs. You need your digits. You, yeah, I agree, man. How are you gonna eat quesadillas? That's true, <laughs> and I do enjoy a good quesadilla. All right, your turn, Brian. Speaking of quesadillas. Oh, delicious. Ay 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 ay! What is your favorite kind of cheese and why? Brian, 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 you have hit the mother load, my friend, because I am a cheese connoisseur. <laughs> I love cheese so much. It's that when I say I love pop bellies, free plug. And if they want to sponsor the show at any point in time, just give me a call. But if they, the only sandwich I get is a BLT with cheese. I add the cheese. I take out the tomato. I add the cheese. It only has three ingredients, bacon, lettuce, and cheese, Brian. I love me some cheese. And you pay $9 for it. I love <laughs> cheese. So you asked the right person. You came to the right, to the right hallway. Let me direct you. So if you are a man of simple tastes, as I am, you prefer a more bland flavor, which is fine, which is fine. And I say provolone is the most underrated cheese of the entire cheese wheel, let's say, because it gets, it has a sharp provolone and it has a dull provolone. It offers you all the assortment of cheese that you could ever need and it gives you a wide variety of flavor. Gotta, gotta go with the provolone white cheese. You say? Over pepper jack? Yes. Uh, Gouda? Whoa. Gouda? Gouda's so good. Smoked Gouda cheese? Mm, oh. I don't see that much That's on my That's underrated. Menu. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to go back to Istanbul or wherever they get Gouda from. Gouda is so good. I, ro I love that crumbly white cheese that they put on beans and Mexican Cotija. Oh, That's Cotija that cheese. That is the bomb. That is really good. All right. Well, there we go. We have a little bit of a disagreement here, but... And all in all, all cheese is good. You That's know what? True. I agree. All right. We can all agree to agree on that. <laughs> all right. I got a game. Brian, you can play. Ruby, you can play. Katy Perry has sent out a social media release confirming her becoming one of the new judges for ABC's revamped show, American Idol. The, sh the show you never knew that you never missed. All right. She is the first of the confirmed judges for the new show on NBC and an honor of American Idol's resurrection from the dead, I have a list of 10 celebrities who have emerged from American Idol, and I want you both to tell me which celebrity has the higher net worth. So I'm gonna give you two, you tell me which one has more of a net worth, all right? First one, David Archuleta, the season seven runner-up in 2008, or Elliot Yameen, the third place uh, in season five, 2006. Brian? You said the first dude was from season three? The first guy was from season seven. C-O. David Archuleta. I've heard of him. Yeah. But I never heard of the other person. That's exactly my thought. But it was so big at the beginning. If you want it, you got like bigger money coming out than you do now. They are on season like 80. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the last one was season 12. Well, um, I'm going to go with Archuleta because he's the only one I heard of. Right. I agree. Are you agree? Yeah. You're both wrong. Uh, is, see, I told you. It is Elliot Yameen, who has uh, barely edges him out, net worth of $6 million to Archuleta's $5 million. All right, next pairing. David Cook, season seven winner of 2008, or Jordan Sparks, the season six winner, going winner against winner in 2007 and 2008, Jordan Sparks won 2007. So David Cook or Jordan Sparks, Brian. 
I'm gonna go with Jordan Sparks because she won earlier again and Eventually that's got to win out, right? I don't remember hearing anything from the other dude, so. Well, see, I would normally agree, but I feel like David Cook had more than one album that actually worked out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go David Cook. Just be, just, just to be against you, Brian. I'm going to break some news right here. One of you's right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the winner is Jordan Sparks with a net worth of $10 million compared to David Cook's $5 million. <laughs> All right, next one. It only gets harder from here. You know what, Brian? We'll see in poker. <laughs> we'll see who the real winner is. Carrie Underwood, season four winner, she 2005. Wins. Whoa. <laughs> calling a shot. You don't want to hear the second one? I'm calling in the dark. Oh. <laughs> okay. Are you part Irish? Because that was pretty cockney. <laughs> All right. Gore. I'll vote the other in the dark. Clay Aiken, season oh, two. No, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Oh, so you both want no, to be no, no. So I No, I'm going to still go with. I will say, choice. if this helps, because I was just reading up on um, slight little blurbs, Clay Aiken did run for office. No, I don't know where, but... but clearly he didn't win. I heard, though, that he played his own music for his kids, and his kids hated it. Like, he played <laughs> well, in the Well, he does radio. have a lot of Christmas hits, and he has more uh, studio recordings than the winner that year, Reuben Foster. I don't even know who that is. See? But everybody knows Clay Aiken. Clay Aiken has named him. But Foster was the big yeah, the, black man, yeah. right? See? And I have never watched more than like 20 minutes of that hey, That was the one season that I think everybody watched. All right, so so anyway, I'm right. So I'm going to have to agree with Carrie Underwood. So you're both going Carrie Underwood. Yeah. This is the biggest deficit. Of course it is Carrie Underwood with yeah. a net worth of $75 million to Clay Aiken's $7 million. She when still plays at like music Oh festivals. yeah, I think she's, she's even a part of the NBC Sunday Night Football package where she does the intro song. Oh, oh. see, there you go. She's she got a ton huge of money deal. Well, that at Tank Hank, Hank Williams off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next one. Got a couple more big names here. Adam Lambert, the season eight runner-up in 2009, or Chris Daughtry of the band Daughtry, fourth place in season five of 2006. This one's pretty close. Brian. I, did, I didn't know Daughtry started on American Idol. Isn't that fascinating? That, that Well, he's so low that he finished like semi-reasonably low that he elevated himself to become separate of that. Brian? Adam I Lambert? think Daughtry. I oh. think he's made a few albums. I can't. What was the first one? Adam Lambert. What do you want from me? I think he made one or two. What do you yeah, want from me? He had hits. And I don't Ghost think he Town. had albums. Ghost Town. Yeah, but those are hits. No. Oh, oh, you're saying Daughtry. Daughtry had albums. I think I'm thinking Daughtry. So you're both going Daughtry? Yeah. Yeah. You are both absolutely wrong. And Adam Lambert has a net worth of $16 million compared to Daughtry's paltry $10 million. Go cry me a river with only six million dollars less. If only we were all so lucky. And last one, we've got Jennifer Hudson, who got seventh place in season three, 2004, or Kelly Clarkson, season one winner, 2002. And I will say this is actually one of the closest deficits we have. So do so. In, what if were that, their years? We've got 2004 to 2002. Jennifer Hudson is in 2004, of course. And uh, Kelly Clarkson was the original season one winner. Have you taken in the valuation of the cost of living into this? Oh my yeah, goodness. You know. <laughs> I'm sure what also is, is pulled into here, though, is movies and such, which Jennifer Hudson was in Dreamgirls, won an Academy Award oh, for it. Oh, yeah, she's an actress. She was. And she, yes, and she's also in commercials recently. She was in a Super Bowl ad, I believe, singing Come Together something. I'm going to go with the first one just because I think you're trying to sell us on Hudson. Hudson. Oh. You're going I, with Jennifer. So you're I going with Jennifer so. Hudson? No, the other one. Oh, the season one oh, winner. Kelly Clarkson. You're Kelly, going Kelly Clarkson. Clarkson. I'm going Clarkson. Well, Kelly Clarkson did have a couple few hits off of that first initial one. I mean, she had a couple after that, mm -hmm. but it wasn't anything. Like Nothing. Like Already that. gone. Uh, walk away. Walk away was a big one. Walk away. Oh my god. <laughs> so uh, Jennifer. Yeah, Hudson. I'm gonna go with Hudson. One of you's right again. Unbelievably. Brent. Kelly Clarkson did have a higher net worth with $28 million to Jennifer Hudson's $20 million. 
I'm that out. show was a gold mine if you f- could win it for yes. the first few years. Yeah, Carrie Underwood was a season four winner, and she obviously took the number one place with seventy five million. Uh, but right after her was Kelly Clarkson with twenty eight million. So it was a pretty That's big a deal. That's a pretty large margin. Mm-hmm. And on a side note, that show made it so that I decided I was never gonna pay for music again. Can I say that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> as long as you don't admit to anything, and you're, you know, uh, you know why? William Hung. Do you remember? You, might have, to, you might have to clarify that on that. <laughs> Cause she banged, she banged. Oh yeah, that Oriental guy. Yes, he, he did the Ricky Martin <laughs> audition <laughs> cover. Yes, that guy made three albums. Oh, William Hope That's Christmas with, <laughs> like three albums. I said, all right, if they're gonna let this guy make music. I can't support this industry. That's you can't anymore. support music at all. That's almost I like of music, one but artist. I'm not gonna pay for an album that some of that money goes to William Hung making. <laughs> oh my god! I can't do it. That's almost as bad as Kids Bob. I can't. Nothing. Is I can't. As bad as I can't do it. Absolutely nothing. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Ruby. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the study session. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll later. tag you out. See you later. Brian, it is your turn. So I have a kind of serious sports question All right. uh, involving the Valley. Do you want the Coyotes to stay, and what do you think their best chances of staying are? Oh, interesting. I'll, I'll attack it in reverse first. Their best chances of staying are if uh, somebody like you, who's a real hockey fan or, or even a casual, just if somebody uh, like you wins the lottery, buys the Phoenix <laughs> Coyotes, <laughs> And keeps them here and somehow gets the city of Phoenix to pay for a stadium because all owners are now in this, um, what is it, position of power to leverage and get the city of, or state of wherever they are to pay for their stadiums. Because why pay for it if you don't have to? Uh, but besides that, uh, do I want the Coyotes to say stay? I say no. Um, there's no point to them being here. For one, <laughs> I think it's very much like the... Uh, the uh, Vancouver Grizzlies of the NBA, the oh, the Canadian teams of the NFL, the you know, it's it's really just why bother? Nobody cares, and it's really not doing you any good to have a have a fledgling team out here, and God forbid they actually win something, only two people will enjoy it. And the rest of the team players, I say no, get them out of here. Get them to a place that really deserves or deserves them, like Idaho. What does Idaho have? <laughs> I, <laughs> potatoes. Potatoes and give them hockey. Give them, give, them, give them a potato as a puck. There you go. It, it'd be a genuine puck, a, a pack. Well, I, I have to disagree. I would love for them to stay. I just don't see it getting done anyway. Their best shot was the deal with ASU to build a joint arena, and that fell through, and I don't see it happening. It breaks my heart that we're not gonna have professional hockey here in the next two years, but what are you gonna do? Nothing, because nobody wants hockey here, Brian. Boo. Boo. All right. Brian, you are a fashion-forward fashionista. (laughs) <laughs> Complete with socks and sandals today. God bless you. Uh, a new line of clothing has launched today, though. Uh, labeled the Romp Him is an entire new genre of clothing that offers rompers for men. Yes, men have seemed to embrace the quote-unquote grown-up onesie and has already raised $145,000 on Kickstarter in less than two days, far exceeding the Chicago-based company's original $10,000 goal. Now, I have a picture here to show you in case it, it intrigues you, because I have to ask you, Brian, will you buy or wear a romp him? And if, n- and if not, which I semi-suspect you will choose, is there an amount you would take to wear one? The biggest problem I see with this uh-huh. is it looks like it's going to be hard to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and it needs like a, it needs a, almost a zipper feature. It needs feature. a flap in the back and or please, something. Please, a, a flap in the back. <laughs> and please, for anybody listening, 
please look this up. It is absolutely hysterical. The romp him. Enjoy. Enjoy the ensuing internet uh, deep hole that you'll get yourself into. It is worth all the time in the world. It is hilarious. The memes are hilarious. And is there an amount you would take to wear one? Where do I have to wear it? Oh, you have to wear it all day. All day as go to work and wear it. Um... I'm pretty easy. If anybody knows me, I'm pretty easy. It probably wouldn't take very much money. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Alright, let's start a GoFundMe. 50 bucks. Let's go. 50 bucks? I'll wear a romper around Ooh, all day. Alright. I'm there. What about a, a poker? Wait, but wait, 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 <laughs> wait. I don't want, like, bright pink. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He said 50 bucks. We've got him on record. Like a nice Hawaiian print. A nice Hawaiian <laughs> print, yes. All right, the true fashionista you are, it is your turn. I'd just like to say that I have been dressed my entire life by women. That's why you look so dapper. I have my mom and my sister, and then now my wife and my kids, and... And they do you right. I appreciate that. I don't think I've bought a single item of clothing for <laughs> myself that wasn't a concert t-shirt in the last... 30 years. That's either very sad or very uh, forward thinking of you. It is. Well, it's gotten me so far, so. It, yes, yes. It's gotten you to be the man you are today. It did. Bro, 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 bro. It got me a wife, and that was good enough. That, that's, that's all anybody can ask for in this life. Your last question, sir. All right, I'm going deep with you. Okay. This was suggested by my daughter when okay. I asked her what question should I ask. Shout out to your daughter. What's her name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. The hi, Jocelyn. I will personally see you if this question is too much. Top 100 ranked gymnast in the state, 2017. Oh. Shout out. Shout out. If you had to pick the way that you're going to die, what would it be? Oh, that's fantastic. Um, well, I've, I've thought about because, you know... Uh, and you going, can't say going in your sleep or having sex because those are too easy. Those are too easy? Okay. I, did Jocelyn say that? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you might be worried if Jocelyn said that. Uh, so, I've, I, one of my biggest fears is of how I'll die. That's, like, probably my biggest fear um, because I I just really hate torture. Like, the, even the idea, I can almost physically feel it. I don't know if that's just everybody and I'm just over being overdramatic or what. However, the best way I could probably die, I would imagine, is the least painful. So, if I had to choose the way I died, let's go with a bullet to the head, because I can't imagine that. At the very least, it's fast. And I'd hope it'd be at the back of my head, so that way it's not, you know, those poor souls who have to go underneath the chin and still live. I mean, that's just, that is, oh, that is the worst, because then you can't talk, you're semi-brain dead. Ugh. I know. I know two people that have been shot in the head and Still lived. lived. Now, it wasn't themselves or... No, no, it wasn't themselves. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, I, mean, I didn't know. But they were still fairly functioning after that. So I'd, I'd ask them to, you know, maybe at the... I don't know. However, however it's done, I haven't exactly put much thought into it, but that's my general answer there. Um, all right, my last question... A fight nearly broke out at the UFC Fight Night 112 press conference on Friday, this past Friday. And it was all because Kevin Lee crossed a line while trash-talking Michael Chiza. I don't know if uh, that's the proper pronunciation, but I'll go with Chiza since we're on a cheese thing this, this podcast. Lee talked about Chiza's mom. Lee said, the only reason, or sorry, quote, the only reason he took the fight is because it's on OKC. I'm going to carry him through this car. He's going to headline because of me. After that, he's going back to the prelims. I just hope he shows up. I know his mama's got tickets, end quote. Right then, Cheesa stood up and started shouting, quote, don't you talk about my mom, uh, end quote, seven times with lots of expletives mixed in, and he even charged at Lee. Some would say that he landed a good punch on him. So, Brian, my question to you is, do your mama insults actually work in sports? Is that the line not to be crossed in trash talking? And finally, would you fight someone if they insulted your mother? First of all, I'm going to tell you, all that stuff is staged at the way <laughs> in. No, Brian, oh, no. Yeah, I know, hard to believe that Brian. they would... 
They are absolutely full of hate towards each other. I know, I know. It, it, it's hard to believe. It's going to be a bloodbath when they can finally be legally <laughs> unleashed upon each other. But, no, I don't care what you say about my mama. I don't <laughs> care what you say about my wife. Oh, Mama Meredith and uh, Mrs. Meredith, watch out. You start talking about my kids, Oh, we're going to have issues. Oh, that is very interesting. You know, uh, as a quick aside here, I know LeBron James got into a real hefty argument with uh, LeVar Ball. Not because he talked about his mom or his wife, but about his kids. And I, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. That that is probably the line that people are, aren't allowed to cross. That is my line. I mean, you talk about my mom and everybody knows nothing. Talk about my wife, you know, whatever. You start talking about my kids. They don't know you. They've done nothing. They're not even old enough to comprehend. And they start seeing something like this online or on the papers or something like that. Mm, that's the line. That, that's where you start getting into fight. That's where we're going to have where Papa, quarrel. Papa Bear Brian comes into play. Yes, sir. All right. Dare I ask, did, has anybody felt the wrath of, of uh, the Pooh Bear, Brian? Um, nobody has been afraid to face these guns. No, no, and as he, uh, as he flares up the, <laughs> the biceps, all right. The three-inch biceps. And Vervine being very forgiving on the three inches. All right. <laughs> all right, well, that actually concludes our episode here, Brian. How do you feel you did? Give yourself a rating on a... On a, on a F to A plus model. I got uh, C. There you go. There you go. You only. I was nervous at the beginning. I was pretty serious about the talking. I kind of lightened up a little there towards you the end. You got, uh, you've got a lot of potential, Brian. It was Brian. a little intimidating, but I was so glad to be here. I love talking sports. I love just talking. There you <laughs> uh, Yes, well, that I do know. As being a friend of yours for. Ooh, what, we keep doing this about what three years? Uh, in front of yours for about three, three years. Three, no, oh, yeah. we're coming up on four. Yeah, it's gotta be rough. I was our anniversary was right around this time because it was my birthday. Yes, it was. So and last year you came. The year before year that was that the first year? I think it was. So so no, because you guys came last year. And I can't yeah, three you. years, I think. Yeah, I think so we're, we're just three over three years of being friends, and I do know that you uh, you like to talk, so... And I've I enjoyed every well, part of it. Well, we thank you for coming on. We see a lot of potential in you. <laughs> I don't know why I'm speaking of you in, like, the fourth person of, of the we, you know? It's I, Whenever I have to do these these uh, Facebook posts under the Chop Green page, I always have to kind of take a step back, and I can't be... You know, it can't be obvious that it's Philly up... Philly up. That's the first time I've ever mispronounced <laughs> my own name. Um, but you can't know that it's Philip posting per se. You know, it's kind of got to be third person. So, uh, but no, I'm uh, I'm really glad that you came on and uh, gave us your crazy man theories about the NBA being fixed. We uh, we appreciate a good old uh, uh, crazy theory. It's not theories. theories. It's not theories. It's not theories. People go to his grave maintaining that. It, and you know what? The crazy thing is, you're not alone. I can't be alone. All the evidence is there. All, all the evidence is there, yet it's nowhere. All right, come on. Helen Keller is looking at it like, damn, the sun's got robbed again. And that's perfect pronunciation for her, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't come out quite like yeah, that. Yeah. And, and well, we won't say it like, like how it's supposed to. So um, thank you very much for, <laughs> for uh, being here on Chop of Greens. Stay tuned. We'll have more this week with Luke Wright and Gary Boucher talking about sports and movies, particularly King Arthur this week. Was it a box office bomb or box office blockbuster? Um, thank you very much, and stay tuned for Brian Meredith. Thank you very much, Thank sir. you. Thank you, your teacup. <laughs> for Philip M. Ryan, this has been Chopped Greens. 